we updated the title a little bit to constraint CNN for losses for weekly supervised segmentation to better reflect the scope of our paper, so we hope it won't cause too much confusion. So this work applies to semantic segmentation in general. It's not limited to one application. So it can be 2D, it can be 3D, it can be binary segmentation, it can be in multi-class, it's really open to any application. So as it has been discussed many times during this conference, um, Actually, getting the data to train a neural network is really the expensive part. It's time consuming and it's also subjective. So you end up introducing the expert bias into your data set. And for obvious reasons, you cannot really uh, crowdsource the labeling work. So one direction to solve this is first to use faster to produce labels as weak labels and then to impose constraints to make the full use of it and reach really good results uh, close to full supervision. So weak label is not formally defined. Basically, it's just labels that don't give as much information as a full mask. So for instance, it could be just a tag about the image. There is a car, there is no car, but it's actually quite good. Um, or you could simply have a dot showing on the dot, there will be a car behind it. But for the rest of it, we don't have any information. You can have scribbles which give more information about where the car is. You can have also have another class for the background. But most pixels don't have any information and supervision. Or at last, you can have bounding boxes showing where the car is not and where it is, but not exactly. So there is a lot of works. Um, in computer vision in general in this direction, but a little bit less in the medieval field. And our reasoning is that actually all those weak labels contain location information about the object, but not information about its, sa about it, uh, its shape, its size, or what does it look like. And we argue that in the medical field, it can come from something else. We are lucky, we have a consistent point of view and distance of view with respect to what we want to segment. We know to a certain limit what to expect from the human body. There is variability, but not that much. And so we can have a range of expected values that we can have about, for instance, the size of a heart. We know it will vary between a range that makes sense, and outside of it, we know it's just not good if the network predicts something like that. And we can also use tags directly um, from, for instance, from radio G reports. For instance, we have an image. We can say there is an earth cavity, there is no heart cavity. And so instead of just training a neural network with this parameter, theta, with a narrow function, which will have supervision only for a few pixels, we will add uh, constraints based on the full image prediction. So the prediction are the S of theta. And F is just a function, any function, that will compute something like, for instance, the size, the length, or the compactness of the segmentation, or the location of the centroid of your segmentation. And you have an inequality constraints to limit what it's supposed to do. Um, of course, you can have as many constraints as, sorry, as you want to, but we'll keep only one in this example to keep it simple. So the usual way in constraints optimization will be to create a Lagrangian function when we, where we include directly into the loss the constraints and add a parameter lambda that we'll need to figure out. Um, when we are respecting the constraints, lambda will be set to zero, so we just optimize the initial error function. And when it's not, we have a penalty that we have to deal with. But of course, we, we cannot just simply find first the lambda and then optimize the parameters. So this is a difficult problem. And as far as we know, in modern neural networks, Lagrangian optimization is just completely avoided. Um, because the usual way to solve this will be to have an alternating scheme. First, we update the network parameters, and then we update the lambda. 
and so on and so on until convergence. But this looks great, but actually each dot in this iteration is training a CNN from scratch. So a complete stochastic gradient descent on the whole data set several times. And so this is, of course, untractable for time reasons. And even updating the lambda is equivalent to train a, a CNN based on the first network, on the last network parameters. But this time we do a stochastic gradient descent to update the lambda. So one work um, from Patak et al. try to solve this. First, they were generating uh, fake labels, proposals, based on the network outputs. And then we're imposing the constraints, uh, linear constraints. So that means only uh, computing only the size of the segmentation, or weighted size. And then once they have those constraints as a, on the fake ground truth, the proposals, they wanted to both minimize uh, minimize the Kyle kind of divergence between you, the proposals, and the network predictions. So this allowed them to replace this CNN training with only one stochastic gradient step, and replace this one with a standard gradient ascent, which made the problem tractable. But actually now we end up training a neural network with a standard gradient method, and it is well known that standard gradient methods are not good for deep networks. So we hypothesize that this is why the results are not as good as it could be expected, because we have this suboptimal optimization method for neural network. So what we propose is really a simple idea. Um, first, I will mention that we go back to a setting with two bounds, a lower bound of the value that we allow, and an upper bound. So what we do is to include directly a global penalty with its value depending on if the constraint is respected or not. So if it's within the bounds, we don't have anything. But we, when you are outside of the bounds, the, pen, the penalty is the square difference between the target and what we actually have. And then we can simply do the training directly on that. We don't have any new parameters to optimize, so we cannot we can just do the stochastic gradient descent directly into it. So to show things more clearly, this is the function, what it looks like with A and B that we need to define, and F also. So when we are within the bounds, we simply don't do, do anything. So only the initial error function remains, and we do business as usual. But when we are outside of it, we have this penalty increasing, this global penalty that will be applied to the whole image um, the same. So what it, what it will do during the backpropagation is that it will push this value within the bounds. And once that we are back within the bounds, we don't do anything. We won't aim to be perfectly in the middle of the allowed range. We just stay there. And to backpropagate, it's really easy to compute the derivative uh, of this up to a factor is just the difference between the target and what we have. And then we do the chain rule as usual. And since we are already computing that for the other error um, backpropagation, it's really um, negligible cost added to the training. So we have an example application, which is left ventricle classification. So we use the 2017 ICDC Mikai challenge and only did the left ventricle segmentation. And so we took the full mask provided by the challenge and reduced it up to a point. So the initial image had the left ventricle segmentation, but also the background. And what we have as a result is simply a point for the left ventricle. So we know those are left ventricle, but nothing for the rest of the image. So we simply don't know. And on top of that, well, we have a size, segment size information about the problem but also tags. So some, some slices don't have any left ventricle, so in this case, the size should be zero, makes sense. And otherwise, we have the minimum and the maximum size that we have defined. So we computed this value from a single fully uh, segmented patient. But based on our experiment, uh, we don't need to be that precise with the bounds, just having something that makes sense to some extent. We could eyeball those values. It's already doing a good job. And if you need 
little better results, you can then try to use le more precise bounds. Um, I will mention that when computing the size, we use directly the softmax probabilities, which are really close to 0 and 1. Um, we do that because if we compute the size after a thresholding or an argmax, then we won't be able to backpropagate. But this doesn't affect the computed size much. It's really close to what we have after thresholding, so it's not a problem. So we end up with this function, which is the penalty based on the size in A and B, which is depends if this is the, an image with left ventricle or no left ventricle. And then we have this cross entropy, which is only the applied on the pixels with the label. So only those pixels will have the cross entropy, and the remaining one won't have direct supervision. Instead, the, they will have the global supervision coming from the global penalty, and that's it. So we, we obtain really good results um, with this method. We can see that on only using a few dots and a partial cross entropy doesn't go give good results at all. But when adding the constraints directly, we can see that we get much better results, much closer to the left ventricle. And we can see that our method is really close to the full supervision results. While the Lagrangian is still struggling, it's unstable, it's either over-segmenting or under-segmenting. And we hypothesize that this is because of the standard gradient method now used to train the neural network, which is introduced some trouble. And when we plot the validation dice over training, we can see, of course, that full supervision is doing better and it's more stable. But we are still able to reach 90% of the full supervision dice with only 0.1% of pixels having a a label. And we can see that first, just adding constraints really make it work. And we can see that the Lagrangian method is more unstable. It's really especially at the beginning. And we see a big difference in terms of performances, still probably because of the standard gradient method. So there are still many constraints uh, that need to be investigated with such a framework because we don't only have science information. Uh, we can know where the centroid of this segmentation is, so we can try to stay close to it. For some parts, we kind of know the shape, so we can put limits, a range, on the diameter of the predicted segmentation. Um, we can also have constraints on the shape or the geographical location relationship between different classes. We know their distance sh we should be between some bounds. So if it's in the wrong direction or too big, then there is a problem. And we can also simply use tags as a constraints. Uh, for instance, once there is no tumor, we should not have anything. And if there is a tumor, the size should be positive. So really the take home message is that simply we should not use the uh, directly to train a deep network. And we reach 90% of full supervision dice with very little annotation. But there is many other applications and constraints that need to be investigated. Uh, we, this is a really naive method, and we were really surprised by its uh, results and effectiveness. And we believe that there is many other applications that can benefit from such constraints. So it's really easy to integrate into an existing framework because it's just uh, easy loss to add at the end and we don't have to modify the back existing backpropagation. So our code is available online to give examples on how to do it, and we'll also be really happy to help if you need anything, how to integrate it or just understand the whole paper. So um, that's it. Uh, really check out, you can check out the code easily, and um, if you have any questions, I will be really happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, very interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? I can start with a question. So this is all during training. You have yeah. uh, weekly labels during training, like the size, for example. What if you have those during inference, during testing? No, no. Um, we, 
constraints are only during training, so yeah. we guide the network into learning something meaningful, but then during inference, we don't need them. Technically, if the network is properly trained, we don't them anymore because now we are close to full supervision and it's not required. No, it, it's not required, but yeah. would it help? Like if, we, um, if I annotate a like, few pixels in the structure of interest or, or I tell the size of the structure, how could you use that? Right now, not directly because we actually use it during the back propagation, not during the forward pass. Yeah. So we'll need to do other works to impose constraints during the forward pass. Actually, there, all the, there is already post-processing methods um, that can do that based on the um, network probabilities and the size, for instance. If it's too big, we, can, we end up basically removing um, lower probabilities pixels to keep only the core of the predictions. But right now, it's only during the back propagation and training. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I had a question about uh, the localization, or uh, you mentioned something that currently you don't use spatial information in the, the labeling, only a cross-correlation term, right? And you have some, some constraints on the, the volume. Yeah. Uh, but I can imagine that if your lower bound is like very low, so you can allow for very small segmentations, mm. then the cross-correlation focuses on one point which is really correlated, and then tries to make the region as small as possible, right? Because then you make fewer mistakes. Uh, so, so the fact that you see a sort of plausible segmentation, does that come from the bounds in your uh, volume term? Or is there some sort of region growing or some fo expanding term that I'm missing? Um, so actually, what happens when you, if I understand your question correctly, is that when you use, we use only this part, uh, which is only on some pixels, the naive um, solution is just to predict everything as a left ventricle. So m actually, most of the job is done by this part, which prevents the growing. But also, uh, adding, we did some experiments with only an upper bound, and there was the upper bound for the negative class. But there is a few images. It improved a little bit adding the lower bound as well. So it's not uh, affecting as much images. Because since basically those bonds, it's like 90 pixels in total, and this one is 1800. So this one is basically for the top layers mm. of the segmentation, which is not most images, just a few slices in the whole data set, while most of them are concerned by the upper bond. Oh, OK, so you see that, in fact, the, the max that, that cap is hit more often than actually the lower bound. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, I think we'll have uh, an extended version in the MedAI special submission, and I think it would be a good point to um, simply plot an histogram of the prediction with respect to the bounds. It's something that yeah should be interesting to see. Okay, thanks. That's uh, that's clear. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I had a question whether you also considered using other types of uh, weak supervision, like a bounding box, because I think uh, annotating the, the center point might not be much faster than doing a bounding box, and whether you have already experimented whether this is similarly good weak no, supervision. No, we did not have time to do it yet, but yeah, we especially bounding box, we really want to, to do it, because uh, we really have they really provide uh, negative information about the problem. So one plan that we have will be to enforce simply not anything outside of the bounding box, and within the bounding box, imposing a size constraint on it, which could maybe give be better results. We will have to try. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. Hi, in this particular example that you show here, where you impose a constraint on the volume, I have the feeling that you are also implicitly imposing a constraint on the shape, like uh, probably your model tends to find circles. Uh, is that the case? I saw one of the examples where uh, you got the perfect circle. Uh, uh, well, we will have to try with another data set then, because most of the, the 
um, most of the uh, no, images. Next, next, yeah, they are yeah. on the top right, it's a circular. Well, it, uh, well, uh, with this screen, we cannot see it. It's not a perfect circle, and it's a good circle to start with. Um, so I think the best way to, to figure it out will be to try on another data set, which is not as round to start with. Yeah. And then we will see. Um, there is a lot of work still remaining to do okay. in this direction. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I can uh, and ask a last question. Um, your volume, it's the sum of the softmax probabilities. Yes. Why is that, can it be negative? We could. No, it, it um, cannot, or? No, it can. You mean the sum of the negative probabilities? Maybe I'm misunderstanding yeah. the, uh, so you get probabilities for each of the classes. Yeah, but in this case, it's the binary classification problem. So yeah. we just have one probability for the left ventricle, and the other one is just one minus those probabilities. Okay, let's take it offline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Sorry. Great, thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Wael. Well.